Um, okay, so this is the last seminar, I think, isn't it? Can we? Yeah. The last seminar. Yes. Yeah, right. So this is the lucky last. And um, today we've got Melissa Davies and Mikey Bramage. Um, they're going to be talking about um, a project that um, Melissa's been working on for about five years in Northeast India, um, language education policy planning. Um, we thought it would be, I, I met Lisa out at Cambridge at a conference a few years ago, um, and she was talking about this project that is kind of uh, action, action research, I suppose. Yeah, and our approach. Yeah. Used as an action research approach to do real grassroots language education. Um, so uh, we thought it might be really interesting for some of the, to, to hear some details about um, since we're a small group, I guess it'll be fairly informal and sure. ask questions or whatever. So, um, this has got a BA in Economics and Social Science from Manchester, um, where she did Anthropology and then followed that up with an MA in International Development and Human Rights at Goldsmiths, and then um, an MSc in Social Research social science research methods um, at Sussex. So her main folks, she wouldn't claim to be a linguist, I believe. I'm definitely um, not. <laughs> if, you, if you want to paint her into any corner, you probably want to call her a, an anthropologist, although you'll, you'll see from the presentation that she's worked in various areas. She's working with Survival International at the moment, doing a lot of education, um, direct action, working with communities. So let's hear about um, this project in uh, uh, in India in particular, which is about <coughs> policy and planning at the, at the grassroots level. Okay, so thank you all for coming today. It's nice to see a few familiar faces. Um, so as Peter said, thank you. Um, today we're going to present to you um, the Head Start Totopara project um, and what the team have been working on over the last five years. Um, the team's been quite varied um, in terms of who we've had involved. Most recently, we've had myself, so as you said, I'm an anthropologist or an educator, project manager. We've had an applied drama practitioner involved. We've got a linguist out there at the moment who's been working out there for a year. Um, and we've had um, Mikey, who's a project manager, creative producer. So I got Mikey involved. Um, he was out there for, for a year. Uh, a large chunk of it, um, the most gruelling part of it, was during the heavy monsoon season. So, um, total immersion in a number of different ways. Um, and he was brought onto the team to, to help with the nuts and bolts, the running of the project. Um, practical aspects such as construction, which was of the building which opened this year, the administration side of it, and the most essential part of this project, the glue of the project, which is the relationship building. Um, and also just lots of hanging out, really, in terms of the relationship building part of it. Yeah, not much else to do in monsoon, to be honest. Um, <laughs> um, but he importantly brought a fresh perspective on what the Head Start Total Power project has been doing and aims to do, and using his creative flair to help put together a lot of invaluable footage in terms of documenting language, tradition, songs, music and poetry. So we're both here to talk to you today more as project facilitators and practitioners um, and we're very much learning as we go along um, and we're doing the best that we can do with the knowledge that we're, we're gaining and with the funds that we can get our hands on. So in this short seminar um, we'll not only be touching briefly on a lot of the different aspects of the project but I do hope to keep it in line with the specific interests of the group that we have today. So it's roughly in three parts. We'll talk about the documentation side of what we've been doing. Then there's the education aspect. And then hopefully we'll have time to talk about the project management skills involved in a project like this or the suspension of. So to give you a little background on the Head Start Totopara project story, um, I arrived there back in 2009, really as a, a bit of an intrepid traveller, looking to do a PhD at that time. Um, but I spent two weeks there working with the children, uh, doing a two to three hour day, working with them, doing a sort of play to learn type program. And it was at this time that I was approached by one of the leaders of the tribe who said that they wanted some help to, to be helped with their education, um, specifically um, a, a school that was going to teach in English. Um, so 
over the last five years, um, I took that on board and I've been studying, researching, networking, visiting other schools in India and in Borneo and Cambodia, uh, living in Totopara for extended periods and doing seminars such as this as a means to develop the best approach. Um, and this is why, one of the reasons why we're here today. So any thoughts, criticisms, ideas that you may have are very much welcomed at the end. The project's main activities has been the setting up and running of an education centre, which is called the Chitaran Jan Toto Education Centre, or CTEC for short. And this is for children aged three to six. And we've also been doing a lot of documentation of the Toto language and the traditions. A few other activities we've been involved in, which I'll just touch on briefly, uh, was we facilitated in the building of a traditional Toto house. And as we did that, I had a friend from the UK who was an architect. So whilst we were building that, he was actually able to make a very detailed blueprint of that so that um, if in the future they don't know how to make it anymore and they wish to, we've got that architectural blueprint. We've also, whilst we were out there in the last year, um, we're running an open air cinema for the community, which was largely for the purpose of relationship building and also for the simple provision of community entertainment. And Mikey's also been spearheading um, a sort of mini project with regards to music, which has been collecting the songs and combining them in interesting ways, making them a little bit modern. So hopefully we'll have time at the end to play that and, and maybe have some discussion around that. So, Totopara. Um, Totopara is a small, isolated village in the foothills of the Himalayas, and it's on the border of India and Bhutan, right on the border. If I just point to you... It's like, it's right here. It's absolutely beautiful around there. It's in the, it's in the Dawes region, which is actually that green area that you can see. Um, and it's in the most um, northeastern part of West Bengal, in a district called Jadpaiguri. The total population is around about 3,000, whilst it's quite spread out. And actually the majority of the population is Nepali. But the village is famous for its endangered community, which is called the Totos. If you do a uh, Google search on the Totos, um, you'll get statements such as the most primitive tribe in the world, the most isolated indigenous community in India. Um, this is, from our perspective, a little misleading. In terms of um, primitive, it, it conjures up certain ideas, um, but they're really quite modern in terms of the access of, of knowledge that they have um, with the outside world. They have mobile phones, televisions. The music they listen to um, is hip-hop, recognisable Western hip-hop, uh, dance tracks, um, and certainly in the way they dress as well is quite Westernised. Yeah, actually, when, when I first got that, um, I had a lot of expectations because I've only, you know, I had what I've, what I've read and that's it. You hear words like isolated and things like that and you, you have a certain thing in your head and then I got there and Initially, I wasn't disappointed. There was uh, an old lady wearing rags, um, you know, decrepit houses. Um, and she approached me and she started speaking to me. Um, and she was like amazed. Her, her mouth was agape and, and she was laughing a lot. So I asked my colleague what she said. And he said, um, actually, sir, she said she's seen people like you on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> 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 that told me everything I needed to know. Really. <laughs> she didn't get the irony either. <laughs> we continue to find that one funny. Um, so the, the, the population of the Totos is actually, um, it's around about 1,400, um, although it's, it's quite hard to decipher exactly what the, the numbers are. Uh, one of the reasons for this is because uh, when a, uh, a Toto man marries a, um, when a Toto man marries a Nepali woman, she automatically becomes Toto and their children are Toto. The other way around, if a Toto woman marries a Nepali man, she actually gets outcast from the community and has to live in a, in a nearby town. Um, so it's, it's, it's really hard to decipher exactly what the, the figures are there. Um, the language that they speak is Totbika, you could say Toto, Totbika, um, which is only spoken by this community in this tiny little enclave. It's only them that, that actually speak it. Um, it's closest related language is probably Dimal, um, which is spoken in eastern Nepal, and it belongs to the Beto Burman uh, family of languages. In terms of its endangerment, 
Um, it fits into Fishman stage six, whereby there is still some intergenerational use of the language in the homes. And according to UNESCO's categorizations, it's placed somewhere between vulnerable, whereby most children speak the language, but it's restricted to certain domains, and definitely endangered, whereby they no longer learn it as their mother tongue in the home. Nepali, the Nepali language is by far the, the most widely spoken language within the community. So the Tota language is very much being marginalised. Whilst they speak it a lot within the homes, it is being used less and less, especially by the elders. Um, and they're beginning to, well, for a long time now, really, they've been adopting Bangla and Nepali words um, into, the, into the language. In terms of the Toto identity, you, you could say that the sense from them is that they, uh, it, it's, it's quite, it's, it's very strong. Um, they would say that maybe first of all we're Indian, then we're Toto, or they might say first of all we're Toto and then Indian. But one thing they would never say is that they're Bengali, despite the fact that they are in West Bengal. Yeah, um, another little story. When uh, there was a, a wedding and it was a, a Toto um, man marrying a Bengali lady, and there's lots of Bengalis that came in um, for the wedding. And one of them in particular came up to me and he was very interested in... in in me and what, what I was doing there. Uh, he was asking me lots of questions. Uh, he had this kind of attitude I felt that was very us and them. Um, maybe just because we were, we were both outsiders to this village, or maybe, maybe more, I don't know. Um, and he, he was asking me certain questions, and particularly about language, and he was asking, do you speak Bengali? How much Bengali do you speak? And I said, none, really, I can say hello. Um, he said, why not? And I said, I, I've been learning Toto. Um, I can only normally learn one language at a time. I'm not, you know, I'm not the greatest uh, at, at language acquisition. And um, he said, well, why? Why don't you speak Bengali? You're in Bengal. I said, well, I'm not in Bengal. I'm, I'm in Totohara. And it just came out. I didn't really mean anything by it. I didn't mean a political statement or anything. But I was surrounded by Totos, many of which I'd known for quite a long time, and they burst out laughing, they were cheering, they, they really, really liked it. And, uh, and that really kind of cemented a lot of relationships, it was an accident, really. Um, but they kept talking about it, they still talk about it, and, they, um, and that, for me, that told me a lot, mm. you know, about how they consider themselves. So they, then they don't really adopt much of the um, Bengali culture so much as they do the, the Nepali culture. Um, <clears throat> and there's been quite a few waves of um, Nepali um, immigration into the, into the community, um, which really started at the end of the 19th, early, early 20th century. And there's been different waves since. And so now um, the, the Nepali community actually is larger than the Toto community. Um, in order to give you a feel for the culture and for the language, we've done a very short film um, or just a series of uh, scenes to, to give you a sense of the things that we've been documenting. Um, and this is, has been produced by Mikey, and he's filming these over the last year and, and has edited it, well, yeah, especially for you guys. So, is there something did you want to say about that? No, well, it's just, just a selection of scenes from different things. You've already said it, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, was, the, was the song passed down to Bruce Ram? Or did he write it himself? You got a heart, not on Jim Gonna, Jim Gonna. Yeah, yeah. You should go with a moon. You should not go there, you go there, you go there, you go there, you go there. Oh, it's a just a magic man. Uh, when you just uh, speak to the right, right back, you're just showing your uh, shoulder. So he, in his dreams, he heard, he heard the song. Mm -hmm.
sino si Rubel Nuro ang sa panangunta na pamilya. Ni ganun ako sa agri, pero ang rin ang mga ang mga kung sa rin madang natin ang mga kung sa mga tiba. At ang mga natin ang susugaran ni Asin ako na tiba ang mga kung So hopefully that just gives you a, a little flavour of the of the culture. Yeah, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about, about what you've just seen. Um, they're quite different elements of the culture. Um, the first guy, we'll, we'll call him Gutra, um, he's the second oldest man in the village, oldest Toto in the village. Um, he he can't move, I, mean, I, I had to, you know, his legs don't work anymore, I had to go really far up the mountain. To, to go and see him, so I, I didn't actually go for maybe six months. And when I started recording him, I, I had a translator there, and the translator was having real difficulty, and, and that's because he was actually speaking another language. It's another language that Toto's used to speak, and it's one that's never discussed, it's never written about, it's certainly not documented or uh, recorded. Um, I had no idea about this. Um, I don't think anyone did, really, and it, it, he, um, it's kind of a mixture of, of really old Toto, a lot of words that aren't used anymore, and... Uh, and Boot, Bootier, yeah, we think, yeah. Probably Bootier, um, but we, we can't be exactly sure about it. And it occurred to me at that point that, you know, this guy, he's not going to be around for too long, and he's one of maybe two or three people that speak this ancient version of Toto. So it, it became really, really important to record it because it, it won't exist in, in 10 years' time. It, it just won't be there anymore. It hasn't been passed down. It hasn't been passed on. It's an antiquated language. No one's interested in speaking it. So that, that was very important. And he's an absolutely lovely bloke. Yeah. Um, the, the second person you saw, um, ST, he was, he's a, a bit of a prickly character, he's very cold. When I first met him, he was, he was kind of rude. Uh, and he's either really rude or, or funny, but even when he's funny, he's a bit sort of mean, actually. And uh, when I met him, he was, he was just mean. And, uh, and yeah, to me as well. But I think something, <laughs> yeah. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, but there's something about him that I, I really like, like depth, and he's honest, and he doesn't just say what I want to hear, he just he has this thing. And so I, I kept on it, and he has two children, and they were coming around to my house every day, so I was teaching them anyway, um, playing games with them. So I, I built his trust through that, and also probably from drinking um, Bhutanese brandy. And, uh, you know, and the locally uh, brewed you, yeah. which they make from rice. Yeah, yeah. we, we kind of put the world to rights a few times. And um, I realised that he does have a lot of political things on his mind, a lot, a lot of things that he's not supposed to talk about, actually. Um, I, I think by, by you know, it's not necessarily the image that the tribe wants to put across is that there's any problems. So for me, that was, that was even more interesting. So um, eventually he trusted me enough to, um, well, he actually came out and said, I, I've, I, want, I want to tell you this poem. So he eventually told me, and that's the poem that it was. And, and it won an award as it, well. It did, and that's why he was so proud of it, and he wanted me to know, and he wanted me to, to hear it. And that's when I understood that you know, the words that he's speaking, they're, they're quite 
dark, you know, he's talking about the blood of the poor and, and the rich being, being bad to the poor. Um, and I could understand then where, where, where this, these feelings were coming from, from him. Uh, and maybe his initial reaction to me was just another rich guy in there. To, and he doesn't really know why, why I'm there and whether, whether there's a religious thing as well. And that's something that I had to show him just through friendship, basically. Um, so that's, that's ST. And then we had Callie, who is the medicine man. But he's kind of everything. He's a catch-all toto. He's the, he's the face of toto culture. He's the one when... Indian anthropologists come for, for two days to learn everything there is to know about Toto culture. They'll go and see him, he'll do the medicine stuff, he'll do the dancing, uh, and then they go away and then they know, yeah, they've got everything they need. Um, and it is true, what he does is real, but it's not that widely practiced anymore. Um, it is really just for show, mainly. Um, so it's really important for me to document, but it was more important for me to find people at ST um, and the younger people, and see what you know, what's really what's really going on beneath as well. Mm. And then finally, we had the the, the three dancers. Um, they they do this dance at rituals and, and weddings and things like that. And um, and when we were doing the um, open air cinema as well, um, they would come down, and at the beginning of the, um, yeah, the film, they yeah, would they would show right. this to the, the younger generations that were coming down. They, they were lit up from the, the light from the projector on on the side of a traditional bamboo house. It's quite surreal, the, the mixture of technology and ancient <laughs> ritual. Um, but yeah, that's that's just the gist of of what I was recording. Mm. <clears throat> in in terms of why we were doing the documentation. Um, really that, that came about because um, there are a lot of um, anthropologists and documentary makers from India um, that um, do lots of research and they like to uh, write about them and regurgitate old information and create these documentaries. Uh, the first time I went to Totopara, one of the, the leaders of the tribe showed me this documentary. He was very proud to show me and then all the way through commentated that actually everything was wrong. So there was a sense of him being proud that there was this documentary that somebody cared but that actually everything was wrong. Uh, another documentary I was shown when I was last there on somebody, uh, somebody's mobile phone. Again, you know, look, look at this, you know, really excited about it. But he didn't, it was all in English, so he didn't understand what was being said. But it was, you know, it was quite detrimental, <laughs> actually, to, to them. Um, and so the, the leaders of the community, they recognise that this is happening. And in a sense that they're being exploited by people going in and making these documentaries for, for TV and... Yeah, I should, I should just add yeah, that it's kind of relevant to what I was just talking about, which is um, they don't necessarily want people to see everything that's going on. And so the, the footage that I've taken is not, it's not for a documentary, it's not for, for a wide audience. Um, it's, it's for them and it's for the interest of... of mm -hmm recording their, yeah. their culture. Well, not for us to edit as we, yeah. as we want. Yeah. So they wanted to create something that uh, they could show to people and actually say, you know, not only be proud that there was this documentary, but, you know, say that this is, this is a true representation. So that was the, the first reason why um, we got involved in, in documenting things. Um, but second of all, in terms of the collection of folklore and stories, um, these are stories that we then use in our teaching learning materials in the school that we've just set up. So, CTEC, the Chitaran Toto Education Centre. That was really horrifying, by the way, when that happened. <laughs> I we just made some maths, I turned around for a minute and then they all had a problem with that. Yeah. So the, these are the children in, in, in the school. Um, and um, in, when, I, when I first um, got there in, in 2009 and it was requested to me to set up this, this school in, uh, in English, I obviously looked first to see what schools were in existence. And there are two primary schools. One is a government school and one is a mission school. The mission school teaches in English and the government school teaches in Bengali. There is then a, a high school which teaches in uh, Bengali. Um, but there was no um, preschool that was running or in existence. 
The government does have a program called the ICDS, the Integrated Child Development Services, um, but within Totopara it was largely defunct. It was not really working. Um, and as part of the ICDS program, there um, in theory should be what they call Anagwadi centres, which is um, where the ICDS programmes then uh, are channeled. It's, it's a space for the children and the, and the teachers to go to. So we, you know, we fill that, that gap in terms of providing education, which doesn't exist at all for children between the ages of three and six. So we're really prepping them to, to go on to primary school. Um, at the moment, we're just focusing on that, um, but when within two months of opening this, there's actually quite a lot of pressure from the parents and from the elites to, to, to continue and to expand it into um, a, a primary school. Um, so we've got 56 children, and we split that up into two sessions, and it's really quite a big space that we have, so lots of room for running around and um, an area for a, you know, library and, and toys. Um, and they speak, we have a multiple language situation where we speak, they speak um, Toto, uh, Nepali, Bihari, uh, Hindi, Mech, which is one of the other uh, local tribal languages. So it's multi multilingual. Um, in terms of the, the teachers, um, when we first were recruiting, um, it, it, the pressure was put on to really look for teachers outside of the community. Um, and so we probed this a bit more and, you know, why do you want the teachers from outside? Um, and there was this sense that they would be, you know, better qualified. But actually what happens with the other schools, and these are mistakes that we didn't want to replicate, was that they were having difficulties coming into Totopara. So if they live outside, it's at least an hour journey to get there and back. It's over difficult terrain, over monsoon, it's almost impossible to get there. And the teachers really, you know, they don't have a connection with the children. Um, so, you know, that sense of responsibility is, is not so great. Um, so instead we started, we were recruiting from within the community and it turns out that we're actually quite a few people that want, you know, lots of people that want to be teachers, that were at a certain level of education, that were connected to the children at the school. Um, so it was felt that it was better to have um, those from within the community that ultimately also speak the language of the children that they're going to be teaching. Um, we, as an approach to CTEC, we also encourage very strongly parental in, in involvement. So rather than trying to, to, to keep them out, we, we encourage them and um, we get them involved in, in teaching. Um, and this way we're, we're also you know, teaching them uh, the basics whereby they can then go back to home and, and carry on teaching the, the children. Um, we have a holistic approach. So that, by that I really want to stress we're not just teaching a language. We're teaching arts, we're teaching uh, motor skills, social skills, morals, and importantly, local traditions, and about their environment as well. And we're developing locally relevant teaching learning materials. So we have posters around the classroom which are relevant to the environment in their language, and big books as well, and stories, um, some of which have been plucked from Mikey's Wonderful Mind. Um, he actually created a, a character called Banjo Toto. So there's a whole series um, of stories. Um, we've got a few of these which we can, I might actually sort of hand them around so you can have a little look. But do you want to say something about Banjo Toto? Banjo Toto, he's a... Uh... So there's only one he's if you don't mind passing it around. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're all, they normally have a moral, they're quite simple. I mean, these children are only two, three, four years old. Uh, but typically he gets into trouble and then, and then finds the right, the right thing to do and then he's alright. He has a sister as well and uh, they try and play around with, with gender roles a little bit to make sure it's not always... Uh, About rigid. a boy. Yeah. <laughs> for example, in one he, he gets told off for, for stealing and he has to... Um, his father says he has to go and catch two kilograms of fish from the, from the Howery River and the net's not working and his sister comes along she sees there's a hole in it and she stitches it up. Yeah. He's like, you can't fish that out to fish it. Yeah. She shows him. And, uh, and it all ends up with it. It doesn't stay again, which is great. So the important thing there is that it's, it's engaging for the children because they actually understand what's, what's in the story rather than it being based in 
a city uh, like Calcutta or something where they're talking about fast moving cars and smog or whatever it may be that they can't relate to. So this is really important. On top of, obviously, the language policy for education that we have within the school. Now, this does continue to be a tricky one and I think it will forever be a tricky one. Um, I don't think the language policy for education with, uh, with this school um, will probably ever be static. Um, and that's because the language isn't, it's forever um, changing and so I think the policy needs to um, reflect that. Um, it seems, well, yeah, but before we opened the doors to the school, I had hoped to have the policy set. But um, like I said now, um, I embrace the fact that it's something that every year probably needs to be addressed. Um, <clears throat> it's not just tricky for us, this situation of uh, language policy for education. Um, across India, it's challenging. It's a challenging task for policymakers because of, its, because of India's vast linguistic diversity. Arguably, the issue of what medium of instruction at an early childhood education or primary level is it's one of the most debated subjects um, for Indian school education policymakers. Um, according to the Universal Declaration of Linguistic Rights, all language communities have the right to decide to what extent their language is to be present as a vernacular language and as an object of study at all levels within their education. So whilst we're saying that this is an alternative approach, it, it is actually um, being espoused by the Indian government, um, but statements like these seem to remain only statements and they're not really putting anything into, into action. Um, out of the hundreds of languages that are spoken within India, only about 45 of them are officially taught at school. So turning to research done in Totopara very recently in 2011 by a friend of mine, Sujoy Saka, um, he looked specifically at the use of Bangla within the primary schools and his hypothesis was, as the medium of instruction in primary education for the Toto children is being conducted in Bangla, the children face difficulties in learning and this remains the case. To explain briefly um, about multilinguistic education, um, the, the benefits are multifold. Um, first of all, that the children are being taught in a language that they are most familiar with. India um, language policy tends to be more of an immersion type program, especially experienced by the tribal communities and those children. They're, they're being taught in the state language. Um, so from a very early stage, they, they fall behind because they don't understand what's being taught to them. So with this approach, you develop their, their cognitive abilities, um, teaching them you know, basics, colours, numbers, instructions, morals, health, and then they can, they can you know, develop that um, and it, it keeps them interested, it keeps them engaged and it keeps them motivated. Um, if they're just being taught in a language they don't understand, then they're, they're not going to be engaged. Um, this also encourages um, parents' involvement because the parents understand what are being taught, they can also help out. So whilst we have four or five teachers, with the parents' help, we've, we, you know, we've got a lot more assistance. Yeah, um, so one, probably the most challenging subject that I found anyway in the classroom when you have multiple languages <coughs> is mathematics. Um, it, it's very difficult if you're using numerals, it's like which ones do you use? Um, so we adopted the Singapore maths approach, which is using uh, objects, almost only objects, and counting and very simple logic. Um, because so I think the parents find it hard to differentiate the difference between learning one, two, three, four, five, and learning a logical process. Um, so we're able to do that much, much more easily by using that method. Um, and what we did is we used objects that were pertinent to the culture and to the children. Um, you, it could be stones, animals, like a lot of the stories we had were counting animals. And we'd let them count in their own language, whatever that would be. Some of them would do it in English because they, they're, you know, they can do it and they're good. Some are homeschooled as well. And actually one night I was at home and, and there was a child a student that lived below us downstairs. Uh, it was quite late and she was counting um, and she was doing it really loud and I didn't really understand why I found it interesting because we'd been doing it in class earlier. Um, I wanted to know what she was counting so I went downstairs and 
to my shock, actually, was a big pile of dead lizards. And she was just going through them um, with this big smile on her face. And the reason she was so happy is because they're poisonous lizards. So the more she found, the better it was. Uh, I didn't realize that, actually, my room was full of these things. <laughs> and uh, I, I, yeah. So, yeah, I, I tried to enlist her to, to kill mine as well, but it was getting late. Um, yeah, so it was really nice to see her using that and using, again, objects that are relevant, this time dead lizards, to, to count. And in fact, she was doing that out of the classroom and really enjoying it. It's great. So that's what we try to do, uh, replicate within the classroom as well. Um, so in terms of using the, the, the mother tongue, um, it's also a way of maintaining and revitalizing uh, an endangered language. Um, it increases their self-worth. Instead of them being knocked on the head and being told off for using their language, they're now being encouraged to use it, which, which gives them uh, a sense of, of, of self-worth. Um, all of this leads to a better education and a drop in the push-out rates and increases literacy. In Totopara, there is a massive, they're, they're massively below the state average. So only about 30% of Totos were literate in 2011, compared to 69% of uh, the rest of West Bengal. So given that the community leaders felt strongly about keeping their language alive and wanted to provide a better education for the children, an Emily approach seemed like the obvious choice. So whilst I've outlined uh, the, the, the benefits of um, MLE, um, it, it hasn't been without its challenges. Um, when I first started looking into this, there are different models that are available as to how to put this into action within a, a classroom. So um, there are different models, but the, the most common one would suggest that um, at a young age, you are only teaching orally in the mother tongue and then slowly you introduce reading writing. Then you introduce language two, so L1 to L2, and again, slowly introduce the reading writing, bridging into that language, and then you would do the same with the language three, which may be um, Hindi, it might be the national language, or it may be a foreign language, such as English. So whilst I was trying to sort of figure out how we were gonna play this out in the classroom, um, it, it occurred to me that this, uh, the, the concept of mother tongue and, and L1 um, is actually not, not so, so rigid. Um, and with the, the Toto children that we have, um, whilst they, Toto is their strongest language, they were adopting and borrowing a lot of Bengali and Nepali. So were we to ignore that or were we to embrace that? Are we to teach in a pure Toto or a Toto that is a mixture of the other languages? Um, the other issue that we have is that we've got mm, children that aren't Toto. So it's an inclusive school and this is very much what the community wanted. So whilst we do have Totos, we've got Nepali, Bihari, um, other tribals. And so again, that raises the question of, you know, if we're trying to benefit all the children, then what language are we, are we teaching in? Um, <clears throat> this, is, this is also reflecting in when we make the teaching learning materials, what language are we doing it in? Are we doing it in Toto? And if so, in what form? Um, it's also important that we had um, the, the, I mean, this really stresses the importance of having teachers that do speak the, that form of the language. Um, having a teacher from outside speaking Nepali would probably not be as good as a, a teacher from, from the inside. Um, so it was difficult, you know, to find the right teachers, actually. Um, from, from a language and education policy perspective, um, the, the language situation for us is really quite complex. Um, ideally, from a language policy perspective, considering the language of instruction, you know, considering what language of instruction to use and how we were to develop the, TL, the teaching learning materials, we, we would say no to any of the children that were not Toto. But this is not fair and it's not realistic. Um, furthermore, this isn't an unusual case for any classroom. Even in, in remote tribal locations and around the world, the, the children do not generally belong to one language community. 
So it's an issue that I feel quite strongly about, that it shouldn't be just brushed under the carpet. And that the, the, the multilingual aspect of classrooms, this, this is an issue that needs to be addressed. So we have tried to address it um, within our project. Now, what we've tried to do, um, and what we're doing, is um, language profiling. Of, of each child. So before they begin, we um, go through a questionnaire um, with the parents and we ask them a series of, of questions. That helps us to create an individual and unique profile for, for each child. This results in each classroom being different. It then has its own profile as well. So um, whilst once we know what are the different strengths and the weaknesses of the child, because we've got five different teachers that um, are local, but they all have their different language speciality. Um, so we'll, we'll have, we have a Mech, so she speaks the tribal language, but she also speaks Bengali, Nepali. We have two Toto teachers who speak all the languages. And then we have a Nepali teacher as well. So they can focus on the different children as, as need be. Um, whilst it's really important to um, consider the mother tongue aspect of this, it's really important that we, we don't just ignore the fact that um, developing the teaching learning materials is, is really, really important. We need to do this running alongside the, the language aspect of this. So to make it even more complex, it's the issue of English. So initially, uh, the impetus was to start a school that was teaching in English. Um, but all the parents and all the leaders of the community, you know, they want their children to learn English. English for them equals education. And this is still very much um, what they want. However, as explained, teaching the child in a language completely unfamiliar to them, such as English, would be detrimental to their cognitive development. In general, schools in India use this immersion approach to language learning, believing that the earlier you expose a child to a language, the quicker and better they will learn. Now, to an extent, this is true, and there are many situations around the world whereby the children can successfully learn a language other than the mother tongue at schools. However, those that are successful are generally situated within a particular context. So, for example, the child that's trying to learn English, let's say, um, as the example language, may have support from their parents at home. The child may be exposed to that language via TV, films, signage. They may have friends that speak in that language, so they speak outside the classroom. Um, the child may have, um, and most likely will have developed cognitively in their own language first, and then just be transferring that knowledge already into the language of instruction, if it's English. And they may also be exposed to reading materials in that language, in English. So while evidence shows that a child does far better to learn in their own language, it is difficult to con convey that to the parents of a tribal Indian community or any Indian community when they've been led to believe that to be educated is to speak good English. Furthermore, they believe that the earlier the better is the only way to go about it. So we had to consider this when looking at the mother tongue aspect of our approach. What we've done is we've embraced English, um, largely because of the motivation. While the Toto community and the non-Toto community are in support of teaching the children in their mother tongue, the number one motivation for sending their children to school is to learn English. There is no point in therefore ignoring this and enforcing that no English should be taught at all. And language acquisition studies do tend to show that the earlier a child learns a language, the easier it will be for them to pick it up later. So accordingly, we do introduce English in the classroom, which goes slightly against the traditional MLE model, even to the youngest children. But it is not aggressive, so it's not the language of instruction. We, we introduce it in songs and in play, and whenever we do use English, it's always supported by the mother tongue. This way, the parents are happy because we are using English, and hopefully the children's early exposure to it in a conversational, in, in a way that they enjoy it, will help to provide some kind of foundation for later stage English acquisition. This then also plays into the script and orthography side of the project. 
So the Choto language at the moment, it, it's oral, while its script and orthography are now being developed. The Himalayan language project virtually completed its grammar in 1998. However, some technical issues meant that the work on it was suspended until now. It has been said to me that the completion of the grammar is imminent. And we've got a linguist who's working with the Himalayan, uh, well, that they're, in, they're in communication now, and he's been over there for a year working on the phonology. He's been collecting recordings, and this is where Mikey's been helping out with the footage and with the audio as well, such as what you saw earlier. In my quest to decipher which script to adopt, I've spoken to Bengali linguists and academics who have worked within this community who I hoped would shed some light on what to do. They all said, without a doubt, that Bengali should be the script to choose. Their argument, when pushed, was, was based on the fact that this was the, the state language and that most of the children would go on to learn Bengali at school and it was the language that they were exposed the most to, which in Totopara is really not quite the case. But it was still hard to argue with. It is the state language and it is the language that a lot of them will go on to, to learn at school. However, the feelings from the community suggest that this was not the best decision. <coughs> so, firstly, the, the problem with the Bengali, Bengali language is it's from a very different language group to that of Toto. And across the board, the Toto say that Bengali is very difficult to learn. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Bengali script, <coughs> but its clusters of consonants are represented by different and sometimes quite irregular forms. Thus, learning to read it is quite complicated by the sheer size of the full set of letters. And I know when you've been in a classroom teaching yeah. it, it, it takes a long time. Yeah, well, they, they've actually, <coughs> children have fallen asleep by the time you've run through the, the end of the alphabet, which is, it's really difficult to keep their attention. Um, they get sick. It's quite monotonous as well. And so that, the, the alphabet combined with the letter combination, you get about 350 different combinations. Um, secondly, um, they do perceive the Bengali culture and language to be quite oppressive. Um, they, they do feel exploited um, by the, the local Bengali community um, and do not consider themselves to be Bengali despite being West Bengal as I mentioned earlier. Um, so having a script which represents um, a culture um, which they don't feel connected to is you know, not necessarily a good thing. Um, <coughs> they see English as being an empowering language. It's not just that English equals education, but it also offers um, a sense of empowerment. It's probably no surprise that um, one of the leaders of the community um, who, if you do a Google search, he's the one that comes up, he's the one that deals with all of the government officials, he really does have the most power and his English is the best in, in the community. Um, as a non-linguist, I'm able to, to take a little step back and consider the voices of the community rather than get too caught up in the ideological beliefs of the uh, Bengali linguists. Um, in, in terms of the ABCs, um, adopting a Roman script works on two levels because um, we're teaching ABCs, so the parents are happy, we're teaching English, but also then they're learning Toto. So, just to critique um, MLE, um, our approach and what we're doing, um, it is very resource heavy and we have largely um, self-funded this project which gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, but communities that are wanting to do a similar um, kind of project get stuck because where do they get the funding from? So um, something to be aware of is that potentially those who can find it, fund it may be organisations um, that use it as a sub subterfuge for agendas that may vary from those of the community or as a project such, such as ours. So just touching on three examples, um, you may get um, a human rights act, uh, uh, indigenous rights activist from within that community who feels very strongly about revitalising the language. And then, therefore, they want to start a school using the MLE approach. Um, but those children might not actually speak what you might call the, the heritage language in this case. Um, so 
whilst that would be good as a, you know, potentially good as a revitalisation programme, it might not be to the benefit of those children who don't actually, you might as well be teaching them in English or, or Hindi because they won't understand it just as much. Um, there are also um, large networks of campaigners for um, MLE. Um, but some of those supporters are also in support of um, education approaches which are more close to the capital theory approach in education, taking children out of their homes, out of their villages, um, and yes, whilst teaching them in their mother tongue, just basically translating the national curriculum, so turning them into you know, good workers for, um, for the nation and, and, and civilised. Um, so again, you know, uh, an argument is there is, is, is that benefiting the, 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 the child. Um, and thirdly, it could be adopted by organisations for ideological purposes, such as um, religious indoctrination. Um, so, it's important that along with any language policy, that the curriculum development is relevant to the environment the children are living in. I can't stress how important that is. Um, in terms of... We're doing all right for time. Are we okay? Brilliant. Um, in terms of our approach to this project, um, we both came to it with different project management skills. I was in events management for a long time. I've had training in NGO management, and you've worked in the creative industry as project management as a manager. Yeah. When you yeah, I mean, <laughs> I had lots of ideas of how I try and get get the project moving when I when I got there, and I, I wanted to use what I knew. Um, but the reality is, when you get out there. Project management, it, from a Western professional point of view, is, is based on timelines and achievements at certain points. It's impossible. You, it, you just you can't do that. So you just have to constantly change everything. Your, your methods, your, your goals, even everything. Um, and we're constantly just speaking to the community, really, and, and finding out the, the best way of, of going about things. We're, mm. we're learning constantly. Is you just you can't. I, I tried, and it just doesn't work. It's it's just a matter of being um, flexible, and you know we would come up with all these, you know, sort of fantastic ideas, and be talking with the community about how to approach something, and then everybody would be behind it, and you know you'd start to then move forward on the on those things, and then it would just sort of fall flat on its face, and there were reasons for that. Yeah. That would then take us a while to figure out why they weren't working. Okay, so it was a nice idea. Like they've, they've gone to work in a mine in Bhutan for six months. You know, the, the person that you, you absolutely needed to do that, and he didn't know that two days ago, so he really wanted to do it, and then mm. it's gone. And that, that happens all the time. Yeah. And you have to be prepared for it. And, and in terms of time, I think this is a really interesting one because um, in my head when I went out five years ago, um, I had an idea of how long this project was going to take and um, you know, what I thought I could do in sort of six months, um, it's now coming up to, to six years and, um, and actually, you know, to begin with, you, you think that's a, a negative thing because we're so used to you know, hitting our, our deadlines. But um, I've really come to em embrace the fact that actually, in this context, the, the slower, um, the, the better. And that's because you, we're learning so much as we, as we go along. Um, and also the slowness sort of allows us to change plans and methods without anyone actually sort of noticing. Yeah, I mean, like, as I was saying about ST before with the, with the poems and things, I mean, that, that took nearly an entire year of... of, of relationship building for me to be able to get that and to trust me to do that. Um, so th this, this, I mean, th this approach of um, kind of reflecting and changing and reviewing, um, th you know, this is... It's not, e yeah, it's not easy as well, it's right. It, it, you get kind of, you do get wound up because you, you have this thing and there, it, someone's really up for it and it's, it, there's no reason why it shouldn't happen, and it doesn't, and it doesn't again, and it's, it's difficult not to be frustrated mm. by it. Mm. But, but you just have to then concentrate on something else. Yeah. 
And, yeah. and it's in those moments of frustration that um, often we'd come up with our most um, creative ideas. Um, and either, you know, we're, we're just, you know, sort of weirdos or there's something in that. Um, I think that, you know, the, it's in those spaces that you allow to, to emerge that you actually find some really interesting things and come up with interesting ways of oh, the, doing yeah, things. This has got a profoundly positive, annoyingly positive outlook on the world, whereas I'm deeply cynical. So we balance each yeah, other out very well. It, it, it's good because when, when I'll see that somebody is you know, frustrated, then Lisa will see something in that and she's like, well, why don't we do that? And then, then we just blitz it mm. and we come up with, with lots of ideas. So. Sometimes being spontaneous in the field, you know, that, that so I, I always seems to work. She's just being wrong. <laughs> Um, in terms of um, innovation, I mean, as, as we just said, um, you know, it was, it was often in those moments of frustration when things weren't going right that you have to just take a sit back, you know, stand back and, and, and then see that the positives in it. Um, but really through partnership with people like Mikey, um, a professional creative um, that you know, you brought some ideas to the table that I wouldn't have necessarily, you know, come up with, um, and you know, a lot of it was, you know, seeing ourselves as partnering with everybody in the community and hearing what it was that they had to say and what it was that that they wanted to do, um, and really out of that attitude um, emerged the the mini music project that Mikey was was involved in. Yeah. Um, so they they. they I mean, I can't talk too long about this, um, but they're, they're, in terms of music, they have, they don't have anything recorded, um, but they love dance music. They love a Bollywood type dance music, Nepali. Really kind of heavy that, beats. Yeah, the they, they love that. Um, and they actually play at their weddings. Um, but they do play their traditional music and they write songs, but all they have is a guitar and, and drums. And so they write music, but they, they have no way of of making that into the kind of music that they actually listen to and they have on their phones and they hear on TV. And so at their weddings they're, they're playing and, and it, they, one guy in particular told me that he, he wished there was a Toto language song or something that, that came from Totopara that they could play at weddings and be proud of it and have everyone dancing. Um, so I said, well, why don't we try recording some, some stuff. It, it, it was very, very difficult because I had like a four track recorder and I was trying to record. I was trying to get them to record a guitar track and their drums and the concept of that is, is, is basically impossible for them to get because it, 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 does, it doesn't make sense to them. Because music for them is about sitting in a circle and playing, playing around a fire and, and feeling it. Yeah, yeah, feeling it and it's folk music. So that, that actually spectacularly failed. Uh, I'll be honest with you, but I managed to, I managed to sample a few parts of it and just very quickly in in a day, put together a kind of Western style dance tune, uh, using using some of their vocal samples and some of their drums and guitar, and I played it to them and they they went absolutely nuts for it. Um, they were so happy and they had it as their their mobile phone uh, ringtones. <laughs> like everywhere I was hearing this damn song, and, uh, <laughs> which I wasn't that pleased with, but they, they, it meant so much to them, um, I was really happy to be able to do that. And it is just for them, you know, I, haven't, I haven't played it to, to any, you know, anyone here, but we might play it now. But Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I think to, to wrap the, the talk up now, we'd like to play that song. Um, and just, um, you know, I thought I sort of had about a project like this, it's easy to, to frame it. Um, it's easy to frame it in terms of um, preservation and maintenance and um, traditional, um, but you know what we're beginning to do is, is frame it more in a sense of modernity and transition and continuation. Um, so I think this song kind of represents that quite quite nicely.
play you the whole song, but that just yeah. gives you um, Some nice guitars a sense of it. Some nice guitars that come in, in a bit, that, that kind of bring it all together, but yeah, you get the idea of it. Yeah. It's a, oh. simple, it's a simple thing, and it's quite easy to do, but to them, it, they, they have no idea that that could be done in the jungle. You know, I'm making this in the jungle, this crazy sound, and of course it is possible nowadays. Um, they thought you had to go to Delhi and, you know, like some, however it is they do it. Mm. So it, it showed them, you know, what, what can be done. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks. That, that it would be like a, a positive thing. No, that it would be negative, that it would, it would kind of make the communities kind of um, insular. Yeah. I think the thing to really, um, if you if you start sort of going down the the Emily Road, and if you're looking at any one particular community, is that every single community and every single school will probably have a different approach and a different model that, that they'll use. Um, I just was in um, Malaysia, um, in, in Borneo, and I went around about 15 different schools. Um, and actually, um, if anyone is interested, this, this is a book that was produced from there, um, which we've um, kind of used as our, our base, really, but then built, built upon it. Um, and every single school, you know, whilst there are the, the core tenets, um, they, they looked and they felt a bit different and they're in a different community with different, you know, if you want to say like a language profile, they're, they're, they're different. So, um, yeah, just, just sort of be, be aware of that, that what might work in one community is that it will be a completely different situation. You can't just sort of say, you know, take that and put it over there because then actually it might be detrimental. Um, yeah, it's um, Heritage Language Play Schools for Indigenous Minorities developed by Carla Smith. It was a good, it was a good basis. Yeah. But as you said, it, you had to change a lot. A lot of things just don't make sense. For, so for our community, community. Yeah. 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 So it's about adapting. Yeah. No, 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 yeah, carry on. No, because there's no, there's absolutely nothing. Well, there's there's nothing around signage-wise, yeah. Yeah. So they they do speak Nepali, um, but there's nothing um, you know that's really um, written down like the newspapers. They're not exposed to it. Um, and in terms of the primary schools and the high schools, all of that is in Bengali. Um, so yeah. Hello. I think that's absolutely brilliant. You, you've um, sort of really immersed yourself in the situation and come up with some positive new solutions. So from when, <laughs> seven years ago, it's, it's kind of huge. Yeah, um, yeah. Amazing impact. But it, it really can't be done unless you actually live in the community and yeah. support the community and provide so they're happy with it. Mm. Um, anyway, there's one question mm. that I, I might have missed it. Um, you were talking about the teaching learning materials yeah. and what language to be mm. using. Mm. Um, what did you decide in the end? English? Um, or multilingual? We, so we, we, we. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, it's your turn. <laughs> In the classroom, I mean, on the walls, we have um, we have a lot of, of pictures of things. Um, so not so many words as just images. So then we can speak to them in whatever language, and they can show us on the on the wall where something is. Um, 
but we have a mixture of Bengali and English things on the wall. It is totally It's get the it's getting there. It's getting there. We've we've got a couple that like you have there. We have a couple of things that are just about ready to go. But our linguist, uh, he he he's been out there now for how long? Um, a year in Totopara, and he was out there for a year. First of all, learning so, Bengali yeah. so that he could then better learn the, the language. So it's been a very long process for him as well. He's had to go into the community and and build relationships up. And he is getting to the point now, and yeah, materials will start to be to be written in, in English. In by yeah. script. Yeah. So well, in Bengali well, script and Roman script. And so, some of both. I mean, we're we're going to concentrate on we primarily on on Roman. the Roman yeah. script, and that's because of the use of English in the classroom. Um, but what we're doing is not completely um, hiding Bengali away, because the difficulty is is that some of the children that we have. Um, you know, will go on to English medium schools, but some of them, you know, that their parents are sending them to us to learn English, but then they're going to send them off yeah. to Bengali primary school, which we have, you know, we don't have any control over that. So there still is, um, you know, they're still exposed to, to Bengali. I mean, and this is a preschool, yeah. um, which, which makes it a little bit easier for yeah, us. We can be a bit more flexible. Work, a lot of exactly. oral work, yeah. 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 Um, it so would be fantastic if you could extend it into primary so that you could go on looking at this whole multilingual situation. Yeah. Oh, I hope that we can. Yeah. Situation. Maybe. Yeah. There's, maybe there's a will. lot of pressure on us yeah. to do that and, um, you know, given that we're just beginning to sort of, you know, develop the, the most basic of, um, you know, deciding which alphabet to, to adopt, um, it's quite daunting. Um, so I'm trying to push that off. But then, you know, at the same time, if Originally, I wouldn't have opened up the doors to this school. You know, I would have had everything sorted and prepared, and the teachers trained and everything ready to go before opening it. But then there's something in just kind of getting on with it puts the pressure on, and things then start to, to develop. Um, but in, in terms of the script, it might be that um, if it gets to a point where they, they are officially adopting a script, and the, the, the two are adopted, um, so we're experimenting at the moment with um, when when people are writing down their poems they can either write, use the Roman script or they can use the Bengali script. And at the moment, we've got a real mixture in the community, um, I guess depending on whether they've gone to English medium school or, or Bangla medium. Um, but I would say um, that for the purposes of the play school, it's going to be in the Roman script. And uh, we've touched on it before, but teaching A to Z to a three-year-old is, is possible. Teaching the Bangla alphabet, alphabet to a two- or three-year-old is, is it's extremely difficult, mm. so it actually helps them learn quicker. And, and, and it gives so much motivation for, for the parents, you know, and they, um, they can get involved, they learn as well, and a lot of the parents um, want to also learn English. We don't have the resources to do that at the moment, so actually through um, the play school, we're also doing a bit of adult yeah. literacy at the same time. Definitely, yeah. I know in Bangladesh, the and I think this is why you know going back to the fact that you know actually you know things are happening very slowly you know to begin with it's well you know it, this is a failure we're going so slowly and actually it's not because then you you figure out all these things before you put anything you know, actually into, um, you know, before you make anything official. It's exciting to see all this, that even though it's taken five years or six years or whatever, it, it's exciting, to, it's come a long way. Yeah, I think that's really been with the, you know, Mike used to been out there for a year, and I've just come back after six months. I've only um, just stopped doing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, fresh off the boat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think in some ways, uh, 
yeah, some of our methods seem to them that they're less strict, they're less uniform. Um, that you know they 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 are they have this tendency to teach like the alphabet and numbers just over and over and over again, and things are just drilled in. But we have rote learning. Yeah, we have just different ways of doing it, and and I think creative. it was hard for them to understand why why it works. But they they could see uh, after three or six months actually the difference it was making and how happy the kids were. However, we do do the national anthem, the Indian national anthem <laughs> every day outside the school. It's really weird. But it's it's what yeah, it's what they ask for and, and it's it's still that's still really important to them. Mm. They do the national anthem, they wear a uniform, but then they now they trust us enough to give us give us free reign. Uh, and they 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 could see they're all really, really happy with, mm. with the progress. So, so, for example, in terms of alternative um, methods compared to um, normal um, school situations, um, instead of having the children sitting in rows, we have them sitting in circles, unless there is a specific activity where we're using the board and it might be you know, more sensible for them to sit in, in rows. We tend to you know, start the day and end the day, and mostly we're sat in a circle the with teachers, the teachers yeah. sat down on the level with them and all the parents involved as well. Um, and there's a lot of um, playtime and free time where we've got you know building blocks and things that they can learn, but just through themselves. And then you see the kids coming together, and then they're teaching each other. And that's the other benefit of being in a circle is that they can you know learn from each other rather than everybody just looking at the the one teacher who they might not understand if they're not speaking in their mother tongue. Um, in terms of the parents, yeah, you know, enjoying it themselves, yeah. they get involved in the games, and so I think a lot of them just come to to have a laugh themselves, yeah. <laughs> you know? but you know, that can only be a, a, a good thing. Yeah? I know that a lot of tribal communities in India, they feel that when the children go to the school and they're taught not in their language by teachers who aren't from their community, that um, the children lose a lot of confidence in their community and there's a lot of prejudice and that gets really sort of internalised by children. And I was wondering whether you have seen a sort of sense of increased pride in, in the language and in their way of life by having doing things more in a way that's not sort of appropriate for them. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of um, being able to address that, you know, with them being such young children, I, I couldn't necessarily say it's not been running, you know, for long enough to um, know whether the education is on our approach is having a positive impact. I'd love to think so. Um, but one thing that sprung to mind um, as you were asking this, um, in terms of the communities. Uh, feeling towards their, their language um, with some of the act other activities we're doing. Um, we produced a booklet um, which had a collection of Toto poems and folklore and songs. Um, and I think it was, it was in Bengali so that um, it, the masses could, could read yeah. it. And, um, and, you know, we saw people, you know, just walking around. We had a, an event one evening um, and a, a friend of ours who's, I know, probably in his 70s, 80s, and he came along and he, had, he was you know, holding on to his booklet and he was sat there and he couldn't read it, he was an illiterate, but he was, you know, just, he understood what it was um, and that was an incredibly powerful moment. Um, so, in terms of that self-worth... I definitely saw some changes in the, in the community um, because we were obviously asking for, for things um, and, and they really, really enjoyed doing that and writing new things. And, and yeah, so I think it yeah. definitely helped in that way. Yeah. Well, they, it's hard they, to see with the kids. The kids are so multicultural, though. Mm. They, they, can, they, they can speak any language, they can get on with any kid. You're the new generations, it's mm. very different to the old ones. They, they really are incredibly outgoing. And we. <laughs> We actually have to like. Um, there's a break time that we have where the teachers get together and just you know have a have a breather. And we have to lock the door on the school because the kids are trying to get in. And for the first couple of weeks um, when we opened, um, you know the afternoon session started at half past one, and children were showing up at twelve o'clock. So as soon as the first session ended, they were trying to get in, and, and we we were a bit like, well, what do we do? Because this is really good that they want to like learn, but we need our lunch. <laughs> you know? um, and yeah, so, th yeah.
Yeah. That, that's de definitely you know positive yeah. thing that we're seeing from the kids. Definitely, yeah. Thank you. It is very inspiring indeed. I'm curious about your documentation. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I went in, it was a bit of an open brief, really. You know, I, I didn't know exactly what I would be recording. Um, because to begin with, it, to begin with, it was just really the project management. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't. Spots. I didn't go there to to do that. I, I, I'm I'm a photographer, um, so I took a lot of equipment, but I didn't know if I would use it or whether whether it'd be appropriate. But the more that we uh, the project evolved, the more important it seemed to be. And certainly, when I when I met people like Gutran. Um, when I found out about this new language, which is insane, um, it, it, it then became hugely important, I thought, for, for the sake of, of just having that, you know, because uh, once it's gone, it's gone. I, I didn't realise that was the situation. Because people say that the Toto language is endangered, but, you know, everyone speaks it there. Um, the problem is it's, it's not being taught, but it, I wouldn't say, I mean, Technically, it's endangered, but it doesn't feel like it is. But as Lisa was saying, other languages are creeping in, so it, maybe it's diluting. Um, but certainly with, with things like the, the other language, the ancient language, that was very important. Um, so then I, I went on to, to music. I'm very interested in music, which helped. So I was naturally gravitating towards the musicians of the village just for my own enjoyment. I was playing guitar with them, playing songs. I loved it, it was, it was really good fun. And then I thought they were old folk songs, and I realised most of them were, were writing them themselves. Um, and that was really interesting. Which actually, um, my best friend there, uh, he became a very close friend, PK, I'll call him. Um, he, he started, his brother died when I was there, age 21. And it was a really sad time, and that's when we, we became very close after that. He had supported me when I was alone there for a long time. I supported him um, over that period. And after that, he started, he's an awful singer. He's the worst singer you've ever heard. And he's an even worse, he's a horrible guitar player. But we'd always get woken up in the morning oh, playing him like, oh. Honestly. So he would, he would, I'd hear him every morning at 5, 6 a.m. playing this song. Every day, this song. And it, 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 the way he presented it wasn't, wasn't great. But I assumed that he had stolen it from someone else. Not stolen it, you know, he, like we all do, he's just covering it. And so I'm going around the village and I'm trying to find the most interesting things and recording everything. Um, but he's singing the same song every day and I'm like, Argh. every time I hear it, I'm getting more and more kind of agitated. And then towards the end of my time there, I said, PK, what is this song? Whose song is this you keep singing? And he said, I wrote it. And I said, really? What does it mean? And he told me what it means, and it's about a, a, a young lad who, who supports his parents, and he has to, it has no work in the village that he lives, and he has to go out of the village and perform dangerous jobs to support his parents. And it's sad because one, he's in danger, and two, he doesn't he can go along with his parent. And I realised immediately it was about his brother. And it was just one of those moments where you're like, ugh. That's where it was really, really sad. And he was still singing that every day, every day, since he lost his brother. And it made me feel stupid and that I should have opened my eyes and looked at what was right in front of me. And then as a result of that, we did, he, he did actually have um, other songs and Jeez. stories to share. And one of them, quite um, beautifully, is um, in that teaching learning, in that first book that we've got. It's The Birds and the Bees. Um, now, to go along with that, um, I've got this, which you can have a little look at. In fact, would you mind if I read it out? Because it really is a beautiful, um, a beautiful poem. Um, OK, so the story about the bees. One day some bees made their hive at the top of a tree. They were happy living there. Some birds would often visit there. They would laugh and talk. Their lives were passing happily, but their happiness would not last long. One day two bad people came and set, fires, set fire to the bees' honey and to their hive. 
The next morning a bird came and looked at the beehive. Seeing it destroyed, the bird wept. A bird asked the bee, what happened friend, tell me everything. The bee replied, a catastrophic incident happened to our family. But why do you not feel upset, asked the bird. No, the bee replied, no, no. Though people are able to kill us and burn us, still they are not able to make what we are able to make. And I just, you know. Uh, it's, it's good. I mean, he told me a, a, the, the, a slight variation on it. And the last line when he told me is, they'll never fly. Mm. Yeah, they can kill us, they can steal our honey, but they'll never fly. Uh, they'll never have our skills. Kind of, yeah. It's got a real way with, with, with words, yeah. actually. So it's in, in terms of the documentation side of it, you know, it seems um, you know obvious to go to certain people that um, are the ones who maybe are the the, the elites or um, are the witch doctors. But actually, it's amazing when you just look at those that are in front of you how how rich. Yeah, um, we, the, we can use that for, for teaching materials, and that, mm. that was another huge point of collecting these stories was. That we in the classroom, mm. rather than me writing stupid stories yeah. about banjo. But it's also then being used by our linguist um, to help him, you know, develop the orthography and the phonology side of it all. And he's helping translate all this yeah. as well, which is... Which is yeah. Um, I think it's great to see you put the linguist in a box. It's really <laughs> <laughs> right. You're a beautiful photographer. I really enjoyed the photography and the, and the videos. Thank you very it's much. artistically... Uh, and that's what often linguists miss, is that they haven't got the eye for that. They're all there. They've got the ears for the sound, mm. but not the eye. Mm. It's so. mm. That's good, because I'm rubbish. It's sort of fascinating. <laughs> See the documentation turned around from the way that we tend to look at it as linguists. Mm. Yeah. And we thank our speakers for an interesting presentation. Thank you.